Everybody loves to talk about Apple. I prefer to talk about the oil and gas industry. Here's why. I mean, I know that Apple is on again, off again, the world's largest company when measured by its stock market value. It's a hugely profitable company. And most importantly, it's considered cool by its millions of users, which it is. It's all about style and lifestyle and aesthetics, even how they put their phones and computers in boxes so beautifully. It's part of a culture, maybe even a cult. Because it's so hip, I mean, its iTunes store, for example, is the world's largest music vendor. Because it's so hip, it gets a pass on a lot of issues that would trip up other companies, like the very low wage pay and other uncomfortable conditions of its Chinese factories. And as for the taxes it pays, well, Apple had revenues of $183 billion last year. Its net income before taxes was $53 billion, and yet it only paid $6 billion of tax in the United States in 2012. They paid about the same amount in all their foreign jurisdictions combined. That's a neat trick, isn't it? But back to the oil and gas and pipeline industries that I prefer to talk about. They're not as cool or hip. You don't walk around with a little vial of oil in your pocket like you do your cell phone. You don't use it all the time, talk about it all the time, talk through it, talk to it, about, you know, talk about it all the time. Although, of course, you couldn't have an iPhone or a computer or anything like that without oil and gas, not just for the energy to make those things, but actually the materials in them. Plastic, for example, is from oil and gas. So Apple, the world's largest company by stock market value, only pays $6 billion a year in tax in the United States, where it is headquartered. Apple has a lot of employees, for example, all those kids earning retail wages at their Apple stores. But the manufacturing workforce is in China, making a tiny fraction of what they'd earn if they were built in America, or someplace with labor laws. Now compare that to Canada's oil and gas industry that I prefer to talk about. Last year, Canada's oil and gas industry paid $18 billion in taxes and royalties. That's just in Canada. It paid three times more than Apple paid to the United States. Canada's oil and gas industry added $91 billion to our GDP, or put another way, more than six out of 10 of Canada's provinces. The oil sands alone contributed over 470,000 jobs. Again, more than five of Canada's provinces did. That's how big oil and gas are. And unlike Apple, it doesn't outsource its work to cheap labor in China, which, by the way, gets Apple out of North American environmental standards, too. And unlike Apple, oil and gas pays its taxes. This year, the have provinces will transfer literally $20 billion to Quebec. Anti-oil and gas, anti-pipeline, anti-oil sands Quebec will get a $20 billion handout, which is pretty much the entire tax haul from the oil sands. There's a lot of irony there. That's why I like to talk about oil and gas pipelines. I have no stake in oil and gas. No one in my family works in the business, even though I'm from Alberta. But growing up in Alberta, let me see the ethics and standards of the industry firsthand. There's been oil and gas development in Alberta for more than a century. And big time since the big discovery in Leduc in the 1940s. So Alberta has had a long time to figure out how to do oil and gas in an ethical, environmentally safe way. And without the corruption that comes with so many oil-rich jurisdictions around the world, I've also had the opportunity to take several trips up to the oil sands itself, which is not only an industrial wonder, but a technological wonder and an ecological wonder too. The air quality in Fort McMurray, according to Environment Canada, is far superior to that in most Canadian big cities like Toronto or Montreal or Vancouver. Of course, the quality of life is better there too, especially for the per poorest quartile of workers. If you're an unskilled worker, seriously, no skills, no trades, you can still get a better job that pays you so much up there, even for menial work, that you will still be nearly twice as far ahead as if you lived in other Canadian cities. And that even takes into account the cost of living up there. They're rich. I guess what I'm saying is, Alberta has figured it out. And for Canada's Aboriginal people too, oil and gas is the number one employer of Aboriginals in Canada, rivaled only by mining. The Fort Mackay Indian Band has literally zero unemployment. Compare that to, say, the Elsa Pogtog Indian Reserve in New Brunswick that opposed fracking out there. They have an unemployment rate of 85%. How many Aboriginal people does Apple employ? So I'm affectionate to the oil and gas industry for a lot of reasons. I'm from Alberta, I've seen the industry, I've seen its workers, I've seen what the industry has done for all Albertans and now for BC and Saskatchewan and even Newfoundland now too. I've learned how much all of Canada depends on oil and gas, especially the have, not, won't do provinces that detest oil and, go oil and gas. I mean, God forbid the oil sands were to shut down. <laughs> what would those Quebec and Atlantic premiers do to fill the huge holes in their budgets, eh? By the way, that's a knock at anti-capitalist moochers in politics. 
As anyone who has been to Alberta knows, the province is full of hard-working, initiative-taking Quebecers and Atlantic Canadians who have either moved to Alberta permanently or are commuting back and forth for the great jobs. As I'd like to say, Atlantic Canadians will work in oil and gas. They do. The only thing their province bans on those jobs will do is to ensure that young people have to move west for those jobs, not work locally. Seriously, have you ever heard of jurisdictions so spoiled that they literally pass laws against oil and gas work as Quebec, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick have done and as Newfoundland has done for fracking. Passed laws against their own employment. But hey, Alberta, keep that transfer payments coming, eh? But I'll be honest, what really motivates me to talk about oil and gas isn't its impressive track record. It's the sheer malice of the enemies of oil and gas, the professional protesters who are paid to destroy. Most of them are funded by foreign interests, like the Tides Foundation out of San Francisco or the Rockefeller Brothers Fund out of New York. They pour millions of dollars into countless cookie-gutter lobby groups to oppose the oil sands and pipelines and fracking. They're foreigners who hire local lobbyists to hide the foreign nature of the attack on us. And that's what bugs me the most. It's foreigners hiring local sellouts to attack our greatest industry. Now, if these same groups, the Council of Canadians, that's taken $1.6 million in U.S. money to attack fracking in Canada. If these same groups, like Greenpeace, which uses the oil sands as a profit center and sends money back to their global headquarters in Amsterdam, if these same groups were to attack OPEC countries, like Saudi Arabia and Iran and Venezuela, with the same passion, or actually more, given how big those countries' oil industries are compared to ours, then at least they'd have some moral consistency. But they don't. They only protest the idea of Canadian oil transfers exporting our oil on the West Coast. They never protest the fact of OPEC tankers bringing in foreign oil, including from Saudi Arabia to our East Coast. They only protest Canada's oil sands, which produce about 2 million barrels a day. They never protest Saudi Arabia, which produces about 10 million barrels of oil a day. That's what really motivates me. When they say they're against oil, they don't even mean it. They're only against Canadian oil and Canadian jobs and they're willing to be violent to do it. Fucking don't touch me. Go back across your fucking line. Fucking cowards. That's footage from the foreign-funded protests against an oil pipeline on Burnaby Mountain last month. Of course, the other media don't show that violence, even though they saw it, because the media party is hostile to the oil industry, the Canadian one at least, and they sympathize with the rioters. That's why we talk about oil and gas on this show, and oil and gas protesters. Because if we didn't, who else would you possibly hear the truth from?